Romans, and uh, I've been asked to step in today. My name is John Majors. I'm one of the, the men here who help cover for Bob when he's traveling. I have no idea where he is today, but I'm sure it's for some worthy endeavor. And uh, we'll continue through the book of Romans. Last week we stepped away for the Easter week to cover the traditional Easter passage, Easter teaching, but we want to go back into the book of Romans, and I'm going to try to take us back and get our heads back in that space. We've been going through the first chapter, we wrapped up the first chapter, and now we're into chapter two. And the first chapter really left off with covering somewhat of a blistering condemnation of the unrighteous. Walked through some really hard things that are true of a number of folks who have rejected God, that have said, I want nothing to do with God. I'm going to go a different direction. In fact, I'm going to upend the natural order of life and really say to God, I'm going to do things my own way. I want nothing to do with you. And Paul has had a lot of harsh words to say toward a group of folks who have embraced that type of life. Now, coming out of that, I think some in his audience, and if they were Jews or if they were Christians, those who had been exposed to the law, those who had a moral standard, those who knew truth, it would be easy to listen to Paul's condemnation and go, that's right, Paul, give it to him, and to feel okay about yourself, to feel like, hey, I'm not as bad off as those he's condemning. I think Paul anticipates that, and that's where he's taken us today in this passage in Romans 2. I remember hearing David Platt, he's a well-known Bible teacher, hearing him speak to a group of pastors. And he was speaking to the pastors, and, and he said, you know, one of the worst blights on our culture today is human trafficking. It's just a, it's a horrendous practice. And to think of where you would have to be as a person, to how depraved you'd have to be to be okay with trafficking humans. Because they're, they're not sending them out to pick cotton. Like as horrendous as slavery was in the past, human trafficking today is primarily about people fulfilling their own personal pleasures in a horrendous way. And so David Platt was just condemning that practice, and rightly so. But then to the audience, he turned the corner and said, and if you have viewed pornography or used pornography at all, you've contributed to human trafficking. Now, he knows the t statistics. He knows that in a group of even pastors, a number of folks that week had participated in pornography at some level. And it's really easy to stand in judgment over those who are, have gone to another level of depravity in their participation in human trafficking, yet he's saying, you're feeding the problem. Now, I know this is a light and easy way to start a sermon, right? The point being, Paul is expressing, it's really easy to look at one group of people as he did in chapter 1 and say, hey, I'm okay because I'm not as bad as them, and yet now he's going to turn the corner in this section and say, yes, but where do you stand before God? How have you contributed to the problem? Don't stand in judgment over other people. Where do you stand before God? That's all you can do is talk, look at yourself and look at where we are before God, and he's going to turn the corner in that passage today. Yes, it's easy to condemn the unrighteous, the ungodly, and to feel smug about the condemnation of them. But, but none of us are going to get left out today in our standing before God. So let's look at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Follow along. I'm reading from the ESV. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. We're going to read the whole passage, and then I'll break it down into sections. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges... For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each, a, to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. 
But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Long section, 16 verses. You could spend, in fact, um, I listened to at least one preacher who broke this down into three sermons, so I'm going to try to compress it all into one and keep it moving but it really does break down into three distinct segments verses 1 through 5 verses 6 through 11 verses 12 through 16 and so we're going to break it down into those three sections look at each part examine what's the main theme in each of those three sections and then try to bring it all together and if you look at that flow he really is going to address three topics man's hypocrisy that's our first few verses God's impartiality will be the next chunk of verses and then the last section will be the law of the conscience the law at work in your conscience so our hypocrisy God's impartiality and the law of the conscience that's where these three major sections are going to address so back to this first section and addressing man's hypocrisy man's hypocrisy but God's righteous judgment these first five verses dive into this whole issue and make the transition from the first chapter with this one single word therefore therefore since all this is true of the unrighteous here's what to expect you have no excuse that's that's not what you expect Paul to do since the unrighteous and godly are that way you want to hear we're okay but you have no excuse either this word it's the same word we get Uh, apologetics from you've heard that term it doesn't mean we go around apologizing all the time it's actually from the Greek which means to make a defense to give a defense of your faith that's why we use the word apologetics but this is the opposite of that you have no defense you have no standing before God because of what how they've lived because of where the ungodly stand you, you have no excuse either you have no defense now why is that he goes on to describe something that I think is very troubling It's very troubling because it's the last way that anybody wants to be described. In fact, it has become, this whole concept, he doesn't use the word here, but this one concept has become quite possibly the most damaging word you could use of anyone in our culture today. And it's the word hypocrite. He doesn't use the word here, but he describes the dynamic of how a hypocrite behaves. You say someone should act a certain way, but yet you do that thing as well. You stand in judgment over others, and yet you behave the same way. That's a hypocrite. That's someone who says, I think you should behave this way, and yet in secret I'll do the very same thing. I pass judgment over you for acting a certain way, yet I feel the freedom to do the very same thing. That's a hypocrite. There's no worse word that could be used in our culture today of someone. In fact, there was a book written called Unchristian. You may have heard of it. Dave Kinnaman, Gabe Lyons wrote it kind of came out of the Barna Institute and their research arm. They do a lot of research in Christianity, and they went around asking unchristians, non-Christians, how would you describe a Christian? The Christians that you know or Christianity, what you know about it, what word would you use to describe it? And you want to take a wild guess at what was the number one word used most often? Hypocrite. Man, that's the last word I want used of me. Like, I can think of a whole host of words I would rather be called. Arrogant mean not nice short tempered we won't go on but there's a lot of words I would rather be used of me 
that you could write off as a mistake, but hypocrite? That goes to the very core of who you are. It says you don't even act the way you say others should act. Now, is that judgment fair or not? That's another conversation. But it's there. We have to ask, I think when I hear that word, I have to ask, well, of course, in what ways am I a hypocrite? Everybody is a hypocrite in some way. None of us are perfect. None of us perfectly live up to even our own standards for ourselves. And that's a healthy thing to do, to take a step back and say, how can we be better? How can we be more like Christ? How can we not just pass judgment, but also behave in a way that would honor Christ and honor his name? Paul turns to the Jewish audience here, and he says, standing before God, you pass judgment over others in a way that you're not even able to live out yourself. Now, a couple of comments about this. We know it's a Jewish audience because of this phrase, oh man. Many believe that that was a specific address used toward a Jewish audience. He uses it twice in verses 1 through 5. You have no excuse, oh man. Do you suppose, oh man? It would be much like when I stand before an audience, especially if I'm up north. I was in Seattle a couple weeks ago teaching, and I say, how y'all doing? Now, I'm addressing the whole audience, but who am I specifically talking to when I say that? I want to know what Southerners are in the audience when I say, how are y'all doing? And if I really want to confuse them, I might say, how are all y'all doing? They won't know what to do with that. How can you be more plural? I don't know. But you, I mean, we get it. We know that that's being a little more specific. And I'm trying to endear myself to the Southern audience. And here, when he says, oh man, he is speaking to a Jewish audience specifically. And this condemnation of hypocrisy, is not, it's not a new one. It's not something they just all of a sudden heard from Paul. If you read the New Testament, you see that he, Jesus, this was one of his main condemnation to the Jewish teachers, the ones who were supposed to be in charge of the law. He came to them and said, you tithe dill and cumin, you tithe it well, but yet you have neglected the weightier parts of the law. I think we're all tempted to find our righteousness in something that we do very well, even if it's a very small thing, and yet maybe neglect the weightier matters of the law. I remember... Uh, when I was in high school and college, I worked in this little grocery store in, in Louisville, Kentucky, where I grew up. And, and it wasn't very big, but it was well known for its meat department. They had good meat, so people would come there to get meat. And one of the things we did there is we sold lottery tickets as well. So it's a full service grocery store. <laughs> lottery tickets. Uh, in fact, we sold a million dollar ticket there once. Someone bought the ticket and won a million dollars. And it was sad because it just destroyed their family. It was so sad to watch as they accumulated that wealth and lived it out, it just tore them all apart. But I personally took great pride in the fact that I never purchased a lottery ticket, ever, once. And as far as I know, I've tried to rack my brain. I don't think I've ever gambled with money, like I've probably gambled with my life in many ways, but I've never placed a bet on anything with money. And there was a season where I took great personal pride in that. In fact, it was somewhat of a marcher, uh, marker of righteousness for me. But yet in the same season of life, like as a high school student, as a college student, I was short-tempered. I mean, I was a difficult person to live around. I was judgmental. I was disobedient toward my parents. Again, we'll not continue. But there was a number of ways in my life that, that I was missing the weightier matters, yet I was placing such pride in the fact that I had not gambled you know, it's real easy to do that. It's real easy to be finding our righteousness in, in one thing that really is a, a sub-thing in comparison to the weightier matters of the law, to loving your neighbor as yourself. And in that same season, there is no one who annoyed me more than someone who was self-righteous and judgmental and difficult to be around, the very things that were true of me in that same season and may still be true at times and this is the judgment that Paul is passing on them he's saying you practice the very things that you condemn others for now the danger of this and the thing that Paul warns them of is that the clock is ticking in the midst of this hypocrisy the clock is ticking how long will God endure how long will he be patient towards those, towards the hypocrite, 
towards those who stand in judgment. We don't know. We should not presume upon his patience. That's the danger in the midst of hypocrisy, in the midst of living a life of judgment and hypocrisy. Bottom line, we're hypocrites. The Jews are hypocrites. We are often, I am often hypocrites. I'm not speaking to any one in particular person in here. I'm often a hypocrite. But yet, the beauty of this section is that God is righteous. God is righteous in the midst of our hypocrisy. In verse 2, it says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. In fact, ESV doesn't really do it justice here. It says, according to truth. The, the rightly here really is according to truth. God judges according to truth. And even though our standards change, and we tend to judge people based on what we think is right, even though we don't practice it, God judges rightly. He judges according to truth. He is always a righteous judge. So we're hypocrites. We can be hypocrites. God is righteous. And he anticipates, I think, the root issue behind hypocrisy. No one wants to be called a hypocrite. No one wants to be seen as a hypocrite. And no one wants to think of themselves as a hypocrite. But yet, why does that happen? Where does hypocrisy come from? This next section is going to address that in, in a subtle way, but there's a reason why hypocrisy comes about. So let's reread verses 6 through 11. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. The root issue behind hypocrisy is the opposite of how God is. God is impartial. God shows no partiality. He judges rightly. But yet, how do we act? We want, we want there to be rules. We want there to be things people should follow. We just don't want to have to follow them. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the interstate driving along. We make a lot of trips back to Kentucky, and someone will just blow past us just barrel past us and it infuriates me how can they be driving so fast and you're just hoping that you come over the next hill you're just wishing that you see lights flashing and when that happens I've seen it happens a few times that person is pulled over and you just are fist pumping as you go by they got what they deserve they should not be driving like that and yet there's not been one moment when I've been speeding it has happened, but there's never been a moment where I've thought, you know, I really hope, I really wish that I get pulled over because I deserve a ticket in this moment. In fact, I'm going to call the self-reporting hotline and just let them know I'm speeding and they can, they can just mail me a ticket because I deserve one right now. That's, that's never happened in the history of speeding. No, instead I think I have a right to speed. I need to speed. In fact, I'm a safer driver than most people. I know how to do it in a way, and it's okay. Now, whether it's right or not, that's a, another conversation. <clears throat> but the point being, I've got a different set of rules for myself, and I think should be true of others. I am not impartial. My brothers used to compete in music. Uh, one played violin, one played bassoon. It was an interesting season when they were learning to play those instruments in our home. <laughs> but whenever they went to a competition, I noticed this early on. The judges were on one side of the room, and there was a screen blocking the entrance to the room, and there were chairs to be for them to sit in to play were behind that screen. The judges couldn't see who entered the room. They couldn't see who was playing because the judges were wise enough to know that they could never be impartial. They could never separate what they already knew about someone from how they would play. They knew we have to put up some barrier, some protective measure to make sure that we judged impartially. We tend to have a separate set of rules for how we should be judged versus how others should be judged, yet God is impartial. And the beauty of this passage is here is that God says, 
it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your last name is. Whether you're Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter what your nationality is. You're going to be judged on the same playing field. Like that, that brings great joy. It doesn't matter that you have the law. God judges impartially. I love to dwell on the rich legacy of ministry that I've been given from my family. I've got a triple great uncle, his father. I've got a collection of letters between his father and him and his brother and his father and him. His brother was a missionary. He was a missionary. His dad was a pastor in Vermilion Grove, Illinois. He was a missionary to Africa. His brother was a missionary with YMCA. He traveled along, traveled around. And their letters are amazing. And the steps of faith that they took to take the gospel to the world are just hugely encouragement. I've got a double great-grandfather who was the first pastor at the Quaker Church in Quaker, Indiana. He was the first pastor in that church, in that denomination. My great-uncle still preaches in his mid-80s at this little Methodist church in central Indiana. I could go on and on about different people who served in ministry. I never knew of a divorce on either side of my family until the current generation. A great heritage has been passed down, but... Jesus isn't going to come to me and go, you know, John, I, I looked at your, your family tree, and it's quite impressive. I, in fact, I think it really doesn't matter how you acted because, because of all that went before you. Come on in. No. No. Whether you've been giving a great legacy and a great heritage or whether it's been the opposite. I mean, if your mother and father, maybe you don't know who they are. If they didn't follow the Lord, if they had a life of, of crime and tragedy and, and divorce after divorce and family corruption has been passed down to you, will, will you still come to God? We still come to Him in faith. And we can come to Him whether Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, and trust that He is going to judge impartially. He is the perfect judge. He's not swayed by our appearance or our family background. He's perfectly impartial. The confusing part of this section, though, is the whole thing on works. He will render to each one according to his works. In verse 6, some would look at this and go, well, clearly works must save us. Well, no, look, the whole book of Romans is going to keep drilling in our heads. It's not what you do. It's not about what you've done. In fact, 117, just a few verses prior, the righteous will live by faith. He's already setting the stage. Chapter 3, no one is righteous. No one is good. You can't do enough to get to God. What does he mean here? Well, your works reveal the state of your heart. Your works reveal your standing before God. And you will be judged on that because that will show, are you living by faith? Are you walking by faith? Are you depending on Christ? So he's not setting up some kind of scales and balance if you do enough good things versus bad things that hopefully the good outweighs the bad and then you'll be able to come in no that's not what's at work here the emphasis is is that god is impartial when we are not when we move towards hypocrisy god is impartial so the first section verses one through five we struggle we struggle with hypocrisy. He's speaking specifically to the Jews, but I think we can also say that can be true of us. Yes, even at Redeemer Community Church, some have struggled with hypocrisy. But yet God is impartial. This next section, God is perfectly impartial. I think one objection to this would be, well, surely God will condemn those who have outrightly rejected him, like in chapter 1, those who have said, God, I want nothing to do with you with you i've heard of you and i want nothing to do with you of course he will reject them and those who for instance like the jews have the law and yet neglect to keep the law of course he will reject them but what about the person who falls in neither camp the person who has never heard of god who has no moral obligation to follow the law because they've never heard of the law they've never had a chance to reject him what about them how can god place judgment upon them Paul anticipates that as well, and in our last section, he's going to address that. And then let's reread verses 12 through 16 together to get our heads in this space. Verse 12. 
For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Just merely hearing the law doesn't justify you. It's following the law. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. There's a lot of talk of law in this passage. Usually you can tell what a section about is, is if there's a word repeated over and over again. And the word law shows up almost a double dozen times here. The law, the law, the law, the law. <clears throat> R.C. Sproul does a great job of talking about this, and he loves to use, uh, use big theological words, which I know many in here love. They know you You've gotten, your, uh, you've gotten your money's worth out of a sermon if someone drops some big theological words. So he talks about general revelation, which is different than specific revelation, which would be God's word to us that gives us specifics of how he loves us and who he is. But there's general revelation. And he talks about there being two types, mediate and immediate. Mediate and immediate. Now, mediate is just the word mediator. It means it comes through some other vehicle. It comes from some outside of yourself. And in chapter 1, it was creation. We look back at chapter 1. Uh, he talked about this. For what can be known in verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attri attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In creation, it is a mediate, mediated revelation. God used something outside of you to tell you something about himself creation declares something to us about who he is that's the immediate side of general revelation then there's the immediate which isn't talking about time not because it happened right away but immediate not outside of you it's internal it, it's almost like an internal sense what he speaks about in chapter two where he talks about our conscience bears witness within us and here's what this means every person is born with a sense that there is a God. God has written that on our hearts. Now, there's two objections to this often. Uh, people will say, I've never sensed that. You'll hear some say, I've never believed there was a God. I've never had a sense that there's a God. Well, Paul anticipates that. He says in chapter 1, you've suppressed the knowledge of God. Scripture tells us that everyone on their hearts is written. It is, they are born with the sense that there is a God, that there is something outside of ourselves. There must be some greater reason. There must be some greater purpose to this life. But yet, we suppress that. We, we don't want to go there because that may mean we have to live differently. We may have to choose, make different choices about life. If that is true, if there is an afterlife, if I will be judged, it may mean that I'd have to live differently. So, it's suppressed. C.S. Lewis is... And the other objection is that, well, look, everyone may have a sense that there's a God, but I can't believe that because some people have this standard of rules and, and others may have another standard of rules. It may be the opposite of this list. In fact, if you've read Peace Child by Don Richards, he was amazed that they took... Uh, the cult, this, they, this culture in Papua New Guinea, this tribal culture, they took great delight in deceiving others. Like there was no greater honor to be the greatest deceiver in their culture. So when he read them the New Testament and they came to Judas, he was the hero of the story. And so he went, this is so upside down. But C.S. Lewis, even in that situation, says, even though their values are flipped upside down, they still have a sense that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And it may be the opposite of the way you or I would view it. But there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And so there is a moral code, a desire for right and wrong written on our hearts. I remember Wayne Grudem walking through this and, and teaching on this aspect, this idea of the immediate nature of revelation. And he, was, uh, he went to Harvard and they were on a road trip with a, number of, a couple of other students. And he had been witnessing to one of the students in particular 
And he made this case. Look, every person is born with a sense that there is a God. And it's written on their hearts. And she said, well, I've never, I've never had that sense. I, I just don't believe so. And he made a few cases why. She says, not me, never. Okay, I mean, what, you can't continue to argue that over and over again. They're driving down the road. And they hit a patch of ice and the car starts spinning. Spinning out of control, hit, careening off the road. And in the midst of that, this same girl cries out, Jesus, save us, as loud as she can. And the car comes to a stop, and everyone's okay. And he said, we just sat there in silence. Just kind of thinking about the irony of the moment, where just moments before she had said, I'd never had a sense that there's a God. And in a moment of distress, she cries out to Jesus, we all have a sense it's written on our hearts that there is a God and yet it's easy to suppress because he's not going to shout on top of you and he speaks to us in a small whisper and so will we listen even if we've gone deaf to God though and back in verse 15 he makes this point even if we want to say that no he's not spoken to me no I don't have a sense of who he is we're condemned by our own conscience because verse 15 says their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them the own conflicting thoughts we have within ourselves i don't even live up to my own standards that i have for myself let alone what god's standards are for me i let myself down every day i shouldn't have done that i should have done this i mean you can be completely weighed down at the end of the day by all the ways you failed yourself let alone some outside standard. Now, what do you do with that? Do you slip into depression? Some have. Many have. Hmm. All this brings us back to the very first birth verse. We are without excuse. That's where he started. Therefore, you are without excuse. You are without excuse because in one sentence, these three sections covered hypocrisy our partiality, our conscience bearing witness against ourselves. This is one depressing passage, I've got to say. Who here is greatly encouraged? <laughs> like there's no your best life now in chapter 2. That, that sermon isn't being preached in prosperity churches. It's not showing up in Romans 2. What do we do with it? Okay, anytime I study the Bible, I'm always looking for two things. In any passage... I'm looking to relate to the main characters in the story, both good and bad. And I'm looking for the hope of the passage. Where's the hope in the midst of whatever is there? There's got to be some hope. There always has to be hope. Some of us tend to overly relate with the hero of the passage. That would be me. I'll confess that. When David showed up and killed Goliath, that's what I would have done if I was there. I wouldn't have been like his brothers who were condemning him. I wouldn't have been like Saul, the king who was hiding out in the castle. I wouldn't have been like every single other Jew on the face of the earth. No, I would have been like the hero. I would have been like David. But then some of us tend to struggle with overly relating relating to the villain of the passage. I mean, you, you read about Judas, and he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Some read that and go, I bet I would have done it for 20 or 15. Who knows, I might have just done it anyway, just to be evil and overly relate to the villain of the story, having a, a, just an overbalanced sense of our depravity. We, we're tempted to swing a variety of different directions when we read Scripture. And we want to look for what's wrong in the story and what ways do I relate to what's going wrong in the story. But where's the hope? And in this passage, there is great hope. And it goes back to verse 2 where he says, according to truth, he rightly judges. God, even though we are hypocrites and partial, God is a perfect, impartial, righteous judge. He is always perfect and impartial and righteous. And that gives great hope. I remember the first time I heard that the book of Leviticus was all about hope. Like, that's the thing that people use to talk about how legalistic the Bible is, how boring it is. 
but it was all about hope. In fact, it brought hope and joy to the nation. Because if you consider the setting they were in when the law was given, most gods were very fickle, and you never knew where you stood. You never knew if you were perfectly obeying them to right or not. You never knew if the sacrifice you offered today would be enough. You never knew if tomorrow the, the rules would change. You've all known people like this. You've had bosses like this. You may have had family members like this. You never knew where you stood. That's greatly unsettling and disturbing. But God comes and says, here's my law. Here's what I expect. Here are my expectations. And it was a great measure of grace given to them. And joy and delight, finally, we know what's expected. Now the expectations were high. But it was a joy. It was a grace. God is righteous. And he judges according to truth without partiality. And so here's what this means for us. Because he is righteous, because he judges according to truth, because he is impartial, we can completely trust him. We can completely trust him in every moment. We can completely trust him even when we think maybe his law doesn't seem fair. You might read scripture and go, I'm not sure that I like that part or I'm not sure that that seems fair. Or maybe something happens with a family member or to you or things don't go right at school or you lose a job or sickness hits and you ask, what is going on, God? What are you doing? But you can trust him in that moment. You can trust that he judges rightly. He is perfect. He is impartial. You can trust him perfectly when others let you down. Yes, we let ourselves down, but, but others let us down. We can trust him when others are untrustworthy. I mean, I've had people in my life, there was a man who was probably the most influential spiritual mentor to me very early in a season of intense growth in college. And he, in shortly after he really began investing in me, and we became close friends, left his wife, and, and left the faith. And it really rattled me. It was a really difficult season to go, why would he do this? All the things he has been saying to me, now he, he's denying. And in the midst of that, it's easy to go, God, are you trustworthy? When people are untrustworthy, God is still trustworthy. He, he is still completely trustworthy. When I am untrustworthy, when I have been and will be untrustworthy, he is still trustworthy. We can still depend on him. When his law doesn't seem fair, when we are untrustworthy, we can still depend on him. And then finally, we can trust him to overcome all the ways we fall short. We can trust him to overcome all the ways we fall short. We don't have to depend on ourselves, and that's the hope of this passage. It's not all on us. If it is based completely on our works and how we behave, just one judgment of hypocrisy leaves us in a bad place. But it's not all on us to overcome this mountain in chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's on Christ and our faith in Him. The righteous will live by faith. The key word there is live. Life is found in faith in who Jesus is and what He has done not on all that we have to overcome. He has overcome it. And so all the difficult statements that we read here, all of our passivity and presumption, all of our self-seeking, our hard-heartedness, all that shows up in chapter 2, the shutting down of the conscience, the suppressing of the conscience that's written on our hearts, Christ is the one who overcomes that. That's the hope. Even in this very difficult passage it points us to the reality that left to ourselves we're in a mess but our hope is found in him it's not on us it's not on me to be perfect to overcome all that it's on resting in him resting dwelling in him and then it's in his strength that we'll be changed and of course that's why we come together every week here both to hear God's word as a reminder of Christ at work in our lives, but also to take a very physical reminder of who he is and what he has done. A reminder that he is perfectly righteous. 
he is impartial and that we can trust him perfectly in every moment. So now we're going to move towards taking communion together, this physical reminder of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. And we practice open communion here. So if you know Christ, if you follow him, even whether you're a member here or not, you're welcome to participate with us. We come out the outer aisles, come up either side, and take the elements, the bread and the wine, take them, and return to your seats down the center aisle, and then hold on to those, and we'll take those all together when everyone is seated. as you're ready. I always love to turn to 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul talks through the Lord's Supper and he says in verse 23 for I received from the Lord which what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this 
in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Let's stand. And I will read a benediction from Romans chapter 11. This benediction, John Piper has said, is the reason why he went to preaching from teaching at a seminary. Because after working through the book of Romans and coming to this verse and this section, the class broke out in the doxology in response to the praise of what God has done in the book of Romans. And so in the midst of a difficult section in chapter 2, we want to give praise for who he is in chapter 11. Verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the reminder, though difficult to hear, that we desperately need you to overcome our hypocrisy, our partiality, and that you are righteous and you are true. And we love you and we thank you for that. Help us to trust you in all things. Amen. You're dismissed.